got to. Look at the readout. Mars. I was going to talk about radical hope, and, and I hope. like being used. We do have the opportunity. We'll see that you have a ringside seat for the destruction of the planet Earth. To be better. For the destruction of the planet Earth. And I was going to do all of that. That was all going to go right here. And then I found a copy of the 1988 children's novella, The Brave Little Toaster Goes to Mars by Thomas M. Dish. <laughs> and now I have to write another section. Military toasters. This film is neoliberal capitalist propaganda. Wow. We're ready to pop. Before you tell me that I can't just call something propaganda. Things have changed since then. Appliances on Earth love the people they work for. Because I don't agree with the ideology presented. Welcome. Fellow oppressed ones. Want to know what happens in the book? I didn't know we were oppressed. We're not, but it might be a good idea to play along. You know the master. He never throws anything away. And good business. So... First things first, there is no master in these books. The appliances all live in the house of an old Russian woman that they call Madame. Now, Madame bought the hearing aid because she needs a hearing aid. She bought the hearing aid at a yard sale type situation and she put the batteries in hoping it would work and it didn't work. So the hearing aid has a reason to be there. It is the other appliances who have been recharging and changing the batteries of the hearing aid to help them both. I still can't figure out why they didn't toss him in the old trash row when they moved in. The mistress and the master must like him. Of course they're liking me. Why else would they keep changing my battery? So evidently there's no baby. And from what I can understand from the Wikipedia page, the baby is apparently the child of the protagonist from the other movies, even though there are no other movies. The blankie that we meet in the movie talks about the baby looking like the master when the master was a baby. So I can only presume that the movie is advocating for lifetime employment without promotion. Either way, it means that this whole stupid song, if you can call it that, rather than a lament or a wail, about how great the new baby is was put into this movie with no textual support whatsoever. So was a lot of the bullying. There's a lot of bullying in this movie. Well, listen, you, you radioactive thing, you. You can just as easily go back to where you came from. Who says? We says. says. What good are you anyway? We could sneak up on him tonight and shove him back into his box. I heard that. The microwave in the book makes a couple of rude comments about the hearing aid and all the other appliances come to its defense and they are like, no, everybody does something special. Just because we have different uses, just because we do different things doesn't mean we're not valuable. They're just, they're just chilling. They're chilling. They're listening to the radio when Oh no, they hear an incoming transmission interrupting their regularly scheduled radio time. And what they hear is like, work, 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 all day, all night, struggle hard, fight, because we are populix, and that is, we are right. Something like that. Now, remember this scene from the movie? All for one, and one for all. We don't, don't mean, mean you. you. This line is in the book. This all for one, one for all thing. You know where it is in the book? It is in the work song being sung by the mysterious transmission. The mysterious militaristic voices coming through the radio are saying that. And they took that line and they gave it to our protagonists in the film. So in the book, they're like, what is this? What is going on? What do we do? Marx has been dead for 15 years. No, they don't say that. But the Hoover does say that he thinks that they are red communists. And the hearing aid says, no, 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 no. They're much worse. They're Martians. So they're not even going to Mars yet. They're chilling. Meanwhile, in the movie land, the hearing aid is made so miserable by all of the other appliances that he is trying to escape to a weird, mysterious alien force. He doesn't even know what it is. They were trying to beam me up, not any of you. Who was trying to beam you up? And why? I don't know from where or why. I was doing what I was told. You expect us to believe that? So in the book, they are listening to these transmissions, just trying to like gather some intel, Cold War, covert, wiretapping, Watergate, 
style intelligence gathering is what they're doing. And they find out a couple things about this Martian militia. One, they find out that they are following a Supreme Commander. The Supreme Commander is regularly spouting off this like motivation for his factory employees and he is demanding that they work harder and faster to meet production goals word for word two he is also refusing to evacuate a dangerous nuclear radiation zone and says things like no problems only solution and doesn't care about the terrible working conditions and three they find out that the appliances on mars have their own atom bomb they have a warp missile whose radiation will kill every living creature plant animal and person but will not hurt the other appliances on earth and they are planning to use this warp missile on july 1st it is like march in the book so they have time and they plan to go to mars on april 1st because madame is going away on her first trip back to russia in years probably since the Cold War started. So there's a lot of science about how they are going to get to Mars, which is surprising for a children's novella, not super surprising for a Thomas M. Dish work. Anyway, they use mac and cheese instead of popcorn to fly, but the basics are very similar. They get in the laundry basket, there's a microwave, it's a whole thing. The friendly space balloons still happen if you have seen the movie. There are a lot of little games. They do a lot of I spy um, and it takes them 10 days to get to Mars, not like 20 minutes. So just to, just to recap, the appliances in the book are going to Mars in order to save all of planet Earth from a literal invasion and bomb that they know for a fact will happen. Contrast to the Disney version in which the appliances bully a hearing aid to the point of such desperation that he is ready to be beamed up into outer space by a mysterious transmission that he doesn't even know for sure are nice. If someone told you to jump off a cliff, would you do it? At my age, probably, when you spend 50 years stuck in a junk drawer and a voice from another world offers to spring you, you go. Then, then, when the baby, on its own, climbs out of its crib, knocks the hearing aid out of the way, and accidentally gets himself beamed up instead, they blame the hearing aid. But it wasn't you who got sprung. It was the little master, and he didn't want to get sprung. What are you going to do about it? The master's dumb baby got in the way instead, and now they all have to go to rescue him. Where is the little master gone to? Look at the readout! But you know what? Sure. Okay, at this point, all of this can kind of be chalked up to what happens when you change a story's central character, right? You want to make it more family-oriented. So you tell a story about a family. I get that. Fine. All of those changes can be accounted for, okay? It's not propaganda. Let's just, let's just go to Mars and I'm sure the basics will be the same. So we go to Mars and we meet Tinselina. Welcome to Mars. You're pretty. I know. I was built to be pretty and grace the top of a Christmas tree. I was a limited edition ornament, you know. And in the book, we meet Tinselina, who is the leader of the Amalgamated Christmas Angels of Mars, a group of overworked, underpaid Christmas angels who unionized against the supreme leader and are now simultaneously operating an underground rebellion in attempt to stop the invasion, which includes their rebel leader, Tinselina being the one to adjust the radio signal so that someone on Earth would hear it and come to help them. Yeah, you know what else she's responsible for? Her and her union advocated for themselves and demanded that they be allowed to celebrate Christmas every single month. And you've never even seen the top of a Christmas tree. I know. It's awful to be built for an expressed purpose and then be confined to spending all eternity with a broken down satellite with no prospects. They celebrate Christmas, at which point they also have an election every single month, which is just 
more reasonable than every day, okay? Tinselina is not in an unhappy relationship with Viking One. Some genius smart alecky kid at NASA thought it would be a ton of yucks to put her inside of me. In fact, he is just a corpse in the Martian Appliance War Museum because that is a thing that they have. And to be fair, I don't necessarily fault Disney for cutting that, nor do I fault them for cutting the nuclear meltdown that occurs at one of the, the plants while the appliances are there. Probably not super Disney friendly. Either way, the appliances still get made honorary citizens, just like they did in the movie, and they sit down to have a little chat with the Supreme Commander. So the appliances in the book are Populux, not Wonderlux, and the Earth appliances are pretty impressed with the work that they've done to fix themselves, if not a little concerned. You know, the toaster does, does still say that she doesn't think a toaster needs to be the size of a bakery to do its job, and freezers and vacuum cleaners don't need to fly, and her refrigerator certainly doesn't need to be the size of a pyramid. Fair. Basically, the toaster is like, hey, if we bombed your town, how would you feel? And since you've left, there was a consumer's movement and people insisted that manufacturers no longer do planned obsolescence, citing her sources. They do still say things like wearing out is a good thing if you've been doing your job. I, I didn't say I agreed with the toaster, but that is what she says because she comes from the United States of America. Anyway, she says, I have been shocked by the lack of real democracy on this planet and criticizes the single running person election because she doesn't think it's fair. So she chooses to run with intention and Tinselina gives up her job in order to run the toaster's campaign. Then they have a debate, a legitimate debate, not a song debate, a legitimate debate. And the Supreme Leader spouts a bunch of rhetoric and then the toaster is like, hey, my idea is the exploration of space. You've already managed to get this far, 35 million miles away to another planet, but why stop there? And so the toaster emphasizes the concept of civilization that they created. And she says, hey, why don't you guys, instead of just being about vengeance and trying to destroy Earth, why don't you give up this war effort and go and explore, race out amongst the stars, go see the universe. The toaster runs on a campaign that is built on wanting them to do things that are not working, right? She is like, you do not have to be building war materials all the time. You can go and explore the universe and that is why she wins. I think that she's a he in the book, but gender's not real, so. I'm sure that he or she or it will be very nice. She wins, they still go inside the fridge and find the escalator and the hearing aids brother is still inside and that is all kind of the same. He, the hearing aids brother is still like a, a corrupt war criminal from World War II and he was in fact only changed by the toaster's wonderful speech. That all kind of still happens. But the Supreme Commander Toaster uses their newfound power to end the planned attack on Earth and then restructures the socioeconomic system on Mars. The new name for the Martian fleet is Peace. P-E-A-C-E, -E, Populix Exploratory Armanda of the Civilized Earth. So some of the appliances stay on Mars, some of them leave to explore the universe, some of them choose to come back to Earth. All of the Christmas angels, because there were like a zillion Christmas angels, there was a whole thing. They're all free now. Tinselina asks for a ride back to Earth. She gets appointed chaplain of their laundry basket ship back to Earth, and she gets to go back to celebrate real Christmas. She still has to give up her hair as some organic for them to go home but she doesn't really mind that much and she gets back and madame fixes her up and they don't celebrate christmas because it's april and because you have sat through this whole video i don't think that i need to explain to you how insane this is but i will oh we don't have a long time dollface just give us the highlights right because in 
Instead of what was a complicated and admittedly misguided attempt by the Wonderlux appliances to liberate all enslaved appliances on Earth, we get a blind rage fascist regime hell-bent on destroying all of Earth out of spite in a universe where the metaphor is explicitly that the appliances are employees to the humans. They chose to turn a humanitarian peacekeeping effort to take down corrupt leadership and labor practices and turned that effort into a rescue mission for a member of the ruling class. How that reinforces this idea of idolatry and deference to the ruling class who have so kindly allowed you to be exploited for your labor. But no, you know, I guess human baby loving is better because after all, this way, all of the appliances will be totally stoked not to go off into the stars and explore and experience equality, but instead they'll be super stoked to stay on Mars and wait patiently for their human masters to arrive so that they may serve them. All of that and the character assassination of Tinselina might not necessarily qualify as propaganda, but it is a crime. It's a crime. And that's it. That's, that's the video. So see you next time. <laughs>